Um, well, welcome to this talk on integrated electrothermal design of a SIG EPA. Um, I want to thank AWR for inviting me to be here. I'm actually a professor at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. And this is some work that I was able to do with um, AWR and with uh, CIMIC, uh, a thermal solver that's integrated in here. The real, the real uh, talk behind the talk, if you will, is um, a consideration of silicon versus gallium arsenide PA design. And... Um, looking from a device perspective, and then moving on to the PA design, and then some closing comments, which I hope you'll find um, interesting, if not a bit funny. Um, I have a confession to make. Um, I'm a gas mimic PA designer, and um, I'm pretty sure that if you look at the degree that I got for my uh, engineering degree, it doesn't say gas mimic designer. It probably says electrical engineer. But somewhere along the line, I became enamored with, married to, tied down in some way to gallium arsenide. And as things have evolved through the course of my career, we can now design things in silicon. So I don't know whether I need a 12-step program or a support group, but a couple years ago, I realized that I should go back to my roots and be an electrical engineer and not limit myself to just designing in gallium arsenide mimic or p-hemp. So I started looking at, well, what's the difference between doing silicon design and gas design? Um, supposedly, I was trained in electrical engineering. Those skills should be portable regardless of what sort of material system you're working in. So how does somebody who's, who's a confessed uh, gasaholic convert to silicon? And that's really the talk behind the talk today. Um, on the surface of it, um, there's quite a bit of difference that you can glean just from looking at the material parameters or looking at the data sheets for the foundry processes you have access to. Um, there's the traditional arguments of silicon versus gallium arsenide in terms of the lossy substrate in silicon and the semi-insulating substrate and the ramifications that has for passives and cues and that sort of thing. Um, until recently, it was difficult to find silicon processes that supported backside metallization. So if I wanted to do microstrip design, I had to do fancy things with multiple metal layers um, or I didn't worry too much about my current return path because my circuits were small enough. Um, there's thick versus thinned wafers. The, traditionally, the silicon was a lot thicker, which had impl impl uh, implications for your bond wires. Getting off the chip was a lot more highly inductive because you had a further distance to go. If you had 10 microns, sorry, um, uh, 10 mils of silicon versus 2 mils of gallium arsenide. And through vias as well, just to get uh, uh, ground very close to your devices potentially eliminated a lot of concerns with regard to stability. Um, on the other hand, you can go a little bit deeper into the devices themselves and look at issues like mobility. Um, a lot of people in silicon will tell you that SIGI is not a silicon device. It's a compound semiconductor device. And so you really shouldn't lump RF CMOS or CMOS in general into the same boat. Uh, SIGI is a totally different animal, but it's still, for the most part, on a silicon substrate. So all the issues in the first bullet there apply. Um, HBTs versus FETs. If you're going to be de designing in CMOS versus um, SIGI, you have to make this differentiation. All silicon is not created equal. Which one do you want to use? And each one has benefits and each one has things that you have to consider uh, in terms of detriments. And finally, um, one of the amazing things that I learned about silicon is there are just heaps of metal layers that you can use to route almost anything on if you're willing to pay the price for 6, 8, 12 layers of metal. Um, all sorts of opportunities open up on the silicon side when you have so many layers of metal. On the gallium arsenide side, we're still struggling with getting beyond uh, two or three layers of metal. Okay, so as a gas guy, this is pretty much the design flow that I cut my teeth on. Um, we start with IV characteristics, we do some linear design, we do some nonlinear design, and somewhere along the way we start doing layout. We won't consider that um, in this flow, although um, any of the electromagnetics guys who've been up here the last two days um, have talked extensively about it. Um, and then after we did all that design, um, after the fact, we'd sort of do a study or an analysis of the things that could, um, pardon the expression, bite us in the butt, um, things that we didn't consider a priori or as part of the de electrical design. We'd do some analysis at the end and make sure we didn't really shoot ourselves in the foot. We weren't going to have any uh, problems after the fact. And that's pretty much where thermal analysis in a gallium arsenide design flow that I, um, that I learned on um, would sit. We do the entire design. Is the channel temperature low enough that we're not going to be in trouble? 
in terms of reliability, okay, yes it is, then we tape out. In the silicon world, you actually have to do it the other way around, and um, I'll get into that in a, a little while, but it, it really gives you a whole new perspective on, I'll say, what's important in design, and can actually benefit um, your, your thoughts and your approach to doing galley marcenide design as well. In this case, we have to treat the devices as the core of the design flow, and so we want to do the analysis right up front. We want to understand the thermal characteristics at the very start so that we can design in our devices rather than compensate for our circuit at the end. Okay, so the main device consideration that you want to consider when you're going to silicon Whereas in a gallium arsenide process, we can normally scale the gate finger length um, freely. Um, the, the foundry will have some restrictions depending upon how the gates are printed in terms of E-beam runs or how small you can make them in terms of resolution for isolation implants. Um, in general, that doesn't apply in silicon. You get one size device and that's it. And it's normally um, pretty darn small. Um, that's the only thing you get to work with. Sometimes they may have two devices. Um, various aspect ratios or sizes, but you only get one device. So how do you make something big enough to handle some power or large enough to get you some decent gain or some decent um, matching impedances? Well, you use a device array. Instead of having one long device or, um, or several long devices that are paralleled up, you create an N by M array of these very tiny devices, and the foundry is already taking care of all the interconnects for you, and to some extent, but, but not entirely, the current distribution of getting all the um, power or, or all the current into, let's say if you're doing a SIGI HBT, getting all the current into the base and distributing that current um, and taking into account current crowding uh, to a small degree. But instead, the, I guess the point is, instead of having one device that you scale linearly, you now have one device that you have to scale two-dimensionally. You have to properly array. And you have to think about that array and how the current and thermal effects are going to manifest themselves in that two-dimensional sizing that you're going to do to get the proper current handling capability that you need for your power amplifier or even an LNA. So um, once you get that array size fixed in your mind in terms of overall count of devices that you need, then you actually need to go into this analysis step that I was talking about uh, to figure out what's going to go on with uh, the current uh, and the thermal effect. So here I'm showing two different 600 device arrays, one done as a six, six separate 10 by 10s that I would have to generate the interconnects for to connect together. So I have six chunks of transistor that I need to make sure in phase they get fed on the base and in phase I pull off the signals out of the, um, out of the emitter and, um, and collector. And you can see here that built into the model, um, the same number of devices, uh, aside from any secondary effects, you would expect that 600 devices would um, have the same DCIV characteristics. But what you see here is for the, for the process that I was using, um, something interesting is going on inside the array model. Somehow, um, 600 devices set up as six 10 by 10 arrays are giving different results than 600 devices set up by a 20, 20 by 30 array. And in some sense, I guess you would say that the, uh, the six 10 by 10s are doing a better job. I think those that, we don't want to see that, that lazy knee. We want to see some very sharp characteristics. And the six 10 by 10s are, appear to be a bit sharper and well-defined than the uh, one 20 by 30. Interestingly enough, when we get to break down out towards eight volts, you can see they all behave the same. So we know that internally, things sort of make sense in that regard. A breakdown voltage on one device is going to be the same on any other device effectively, and um, they should all break down together. So at least that part of it's um, holding fast. So what's going on here um, with regard to the lower current, sorry, with regard to the uh, lower voltage case, what's going on inside my device array that's causing this? Oh, so this is the other issue as well I wanted to talk about, the current handling capability. You can see the way the device array um, manifests itself in the layout, and you can get a sense for um, current crowding that you may need to look at at the upper end of current handling. If you look at each one of those uh, vias or vias, depending upon what part of the world you come from, you can see that the via size is constant across the whole array, whereas wherever the feed is for the 
um, base, let's say, more of the current is going to tend to want to feed into the earlier vias than at the end of the via chain because there will be a slight voltage drop across there. And so you're going to have an issue with the current crowding closer to the voltage source or supply of the base and similarly for the collector. Um, and so you're going to have to either design to a worst case uh, design margin or you're going to have to go in and, and modify uh, what the foundry is giving you in terms of the, uh, the array generation. The, the latter of which you really don't want to do. You want to keep what the foundry is giving you in terms of a device array, but you need to be aware of it in terms of design rules and um, getting through uh, tape out into manufacturing. Okay, so before we go into what's going on with, um, with that IV set of characteristics I showed, just a brief note on um, thermal runaway. In general, um, FET designers don't worry about thermal runaway because the multitude of effects that go into a majority carrier device, which is what the FET is, really don't impact um, thermal in the way that a mi minority carrier device um, does, like a bipolar. So in a bipolar device, as the device gets hotter, the current in the device goes up. In general, um, at room temperature and above, in a FET, it's just the opposite. Um, as the current goes up, the device is going to get hotter, which means the current is going to go up even more, which the device is going to get hotter. And so we have this positive feedback loop, which causes the, um, the FET to basically burn itself out. So the solution is something called ballasting. And this is nothing more than adding some impedance into that loop somehow, so that as the current goes up, we have a regulating mechanism to force it back down again by starving the device of the current that it needs. So you can ballast um, HBTs or bipolars by adding a resistor in either the um, emitter or in the base, and this will have a tendency to cool the device down. The downside is that you, you just affected your power out, and you may have affected your linearity as well by adding that resistor. So you need to be careful and not over ballast things and compensate for thermal. You want to do just the right amount because typically this is going to be a problem in devices that you really want a lot of power out or you're looking for some sort of linearity specification to be met. Okay, so here's what happens for my 20 by 30 array. And this was uh, an analysis that was done um, just using the foundry kit. Um, you can see that as I sweep the temperature on the x-axis, you can see that the um, current out for a nominal bias um, it can vary quite substantially as a function of temperature. And this could be base plate temperature. This could be thermal temperature due to self-heating. It doesn't matter. This is the steady state temperature um, inside the device array. And you can see that for, um, for this process, for temperatures below room temperature at a 20 by 30 array, I have a positive feedback mechanism. So as the temperature goes up, it's going to it caused the current to go up, but then something built into the array, and I, and I don't know what it is necessarily because I didn't take apart the array model, I didn't analyze it um, piece by piece uh, thermally, but something in the array, something in the device, a combination of array and device above room temperature for this size um, causes it to go down again. So my guess is somehow the, the built-in metallization maybe they're using some um, polysilicon layers, get lossy at those temperatures and act as the ballasting. So it could very well be that the, the base metallization itself, if done in polysilicon, for example, could be the cause of this. I don't know, I didn't investigate that. I'm just a circuit designer trying to live in a silicon world. Oh. Okay, I thought there was another plot on there. Maybe it's coming later. Okay, so one of the things that we did was to delve into this a little bit more deeply, and we did the design in the AWR design environment with CIMIC thermal simulation built in, so I could do my layout, press a button, and it goes right to CIMIC, and I don't know anything about thermal analysis. I'm a, I'm a mimic guy, as I told you before, but I just know that it gives me an answer, and, and um, the mechanical, or the person who does thermal analysis with me tells me that it's within a few degrees because he's done some correlating measurements, and um, I trust him. So um, I'm really happy with the fact that as a circuit designer, I can just press a button and get um, solutions that accurate. So for a, given, um, for a given spacing of array sizes and a given bias condition on my um, SIGI HBT, I can see these sorts of properties for my um, array size. 
And so I can trade off in this analysis, before I've done any circuit design, I can trade off in this analysis operating temperature for array size and bias conditions. So now, once I know what I um, have to have for temperature to get my reliability, I can zero in on a bias condition and an array size so I can start designing effectively the PA that I'm interested in. And so rather than just diving right into simulation, I want to do this device size spacing exercise as a circuit designer, get my device arrays set up ahead of time, and do my thermal analysis so that I can get the temperature set, so I can do the rest of the nonlinear linear analysis and see the effect of temperature on my nonlinear analysis. Okay, okay, here's the curve I was looking for before. So yeah, I did the two different array sizes, and you can see that there's a significant shift down towards, I'll say, cooler operation if I use the six arrayed devices into the 10 by 10. And this is the reason why we see the better behaved um, response in terms of the IV characteristics is that the heat isn't concentrated inside the array anymore. We've spread it out a bit and it looks more like good uh, devices than if we have all that heat concentrated in one area. So I can make these sorts of trade-offs if I have the thermal analysis built into my design flow right up front because I'm really confronted with two different set of, sets of IV curves. And so I want to pick the IV curves that are going to give me the best power amplifier that I can design. And so the rest of the flow is as you would expect as a gas mimic guy. I'm going to go and do my linear analysis. I'm going to do my impedance matching, going to decide what's on chip and off chip, especially, again, if I have thick silicon and I need to worry about bond wires and uh, DC bias line oscillations and those sorts of things. And for some of the uh, frequencies that we work at, Bluetooth, I think, is what we're um, gunning for in this example. The off chip component or the, the uh, passives can be quite substantial, so you want to do those as off chip components. This is the layout that we implemented. So you can see my arrays in there. And then here's the nonlinear performance that we got uh, in terms of uh, uh, P out on the left there. Um, so it's pretty linear up to about, um, about uh, 20, I think it was 26. But we're going to operate it backed off. We we're only looking for 20 watts linear, but backed off. Um, we've got the PAE on the right. So it does the typical the PAE uh, spike there as you get up to P1. And then um, on the left, you can see the gain is uh, about 10 dB. Um, maybe a little bit, uh, sorry, it's a little bit less than 10 dB, uh, 8 dB. And so that's our uh, a gas guy doing a SIG EPA for the first time in his life. Okay, so um, I guess to sum it all up, um, we're circuit designers. We're not gas designers. Um, I, I would challenge anybody to show me their Bachelor of Engineering degree or, or some higher degree that says that they have a degree in gas mimic design or they have a degree in, in um, compound semiconductor mimic design. Um, there's a lot of things to learn when you're doing silicon. I haven't even touched on things like fill or any of the stuff on the back end. Um, but uh, from a classic circuit design perspective, you really need to consider the devices up front instead of making sure that you're okay at the end. And I guess um, at the end of the day, you're still designing a power amplifier. So all the skills needed or all the understanding needed uh, with how you marry up um, very high power in an active device with passives and um, uh, ensuring things like stability and achieving linearity are, are what rule the day. Um, and I guess in conclusion, um, don't be scared of gas, don't be scared of silicon, um, just embrace it and love it. Thank you very much. <laughs>